Okay, thank you very much everyone for joining. My name is Darren Campbell. I'm a software architect here at Zebra Technologies. And I'm going to talk over what's new for enterprise developers in Android 11 and Android 12. Uh, there's an awful lot of content, I should say, in this, this deck. I, I won't get to it all in the time slot that we've got, uh, but I'll try and front load the more interesting bits. And obviously Android 12 release is for enterprise devices, a little way away. We've only just released Android 11. Uh, and so we'll be putting out a lot more content over the coming years for Android 12. So we'll, we'll just try and hit the, the, the big points of things you need to be aware of. It's also, um, uh, the, the API is finalized, isn't it? But we, yeah, there's no like, public release uh, yet. So uh, we're going to cover what's new for enterprise developers in Android 11. Some of those specific Zebra changes that we've made in Android 11. So not the Google changes, but the Zebra changes. And then uh, at the end, what's new for enterprise developers in Android 12. So that will be the Google changes on the Android 12 side, because we're still working on the, the Zebra changes, to, to be honest with you. Uh, so in Android 11, there was a lot to be familiar with. There was scope storage, package visibility, permission changes, uh, foreground service changes in terms of like the the um, flags that you can give to a foreground service but uh to save everyone a little bit of time we did do a recent webinar on what's new for enterprise developers in terms of google changes uh this is out it's currently on youtube the recordings up there the slides are available um i've even done a an article on tech docs in fact if i just um uh, if I show where that is, uh, if you go to techdocs.zebra.com, then under uh, Android version migration, this is where you want to go for all of your th these kind of configurations and what's new in, in a version of Android. And then under developer resources from Zebra, Android 11, click on that. It will take you to a page describing essentially what I go through in that presentation. So if you just want to know a single fact, you can just search in this page and, and hopefully find what you're looking for. Uh, we have also gone all the way back, Android 10, 9, 8, it goes all the way up to Marshmallow, the, the, the advice that we give for developers on this. But um, back to the current presentation. So I'm not going to go into, uh, I'm not going to go largely into Android 11 changes. Like I say, we've already done that content. Um, and many people on this call would have already seen that, I'm sure. If you want to understand scope storage in more detail, I did do a separate article on the Zebra developer portal uh, on scope storage, but there's also a talk coming up in, not the next one, but the one after, I don't know which channel it's on, but I'm doing a, a talk on scope storage where I'll go into a lot more detail there. So I won't cover scope storage in this deck either. Uh, but with that, that covers the Google changes for Android 11. Let me just go into some of the Zebra changes. So I never covered these previously, so it makes sense to, to cover them now. Uh, so one of the big questions we get from from our sales team is, oh, hey, like we're we're going to try now and, and get our customers to upgrade to Android 11 or next year. The same question will be for Android 12. Um, what are the great new features that Zebra have added so that we can convince our customers to, to migrate? So that's what I'm trying to go to here. Uh, and also things to be aware of as a developer as, as you migrate that's more Zebra specific. So one of the big changes we've made in terms of an administrator is the uh, well, administrator or developer is previously we were having device configuration done through XML. And when I say device configuration, this is like our MX technology, mobility extensions. Uh, you would build your, your XML, maybe in stage now, uh, you might build your XML through the EMDK profile manager. Uh, obviously this is a developer conference, so maybe I should focus on the, the EMDK profile manager. Um, that is in Android Studio under you, know, you install the plugin and then under the emdk option you click down and you generate a profile uh, that will automatically generate some xml for you what we're doing is we're moving away from xml uh we're still going to be backwards compatible don't worry uh but currently that whole process of the, the developer defining the xml in the application the xml being sent to the underlying operating system or the mx portion of that uh parsing looking at the result and then delivering that result to the end user you saw about a 1.3 second processing time 
which seems a bit long um, to me. I, I, it never felt that long, uh, but this is the, the figure that I've been given by the engineering team. So far be it from me to, to question their, their figures. Um, but what we're doing, moving away from XML into a, a, a JavaScript definition. And I, if you're familiar with, with JavaScript, then uh, there is a notation in JavaScript called JSON. It's a JavaScript object notation. It essentially allows you to define objects in JavaScript. Uh, so whereas previously you would have defined an object or the behavior in XML with all sorts of XML tags and behavior and, and, and whatever else. I've got some comparisons in future slides. Um, now the, the functionality is defined fully in JSON. So the EMDK profile manager will create or output JSON. The stage now tool will output JSON. And then the JSON will be sent to, uh, to the Android, to the underlying operating system. It will be parsed, processed, the result will be returned. And hey, presto, you're seeing about a 10x performance. Uh, again, these are the figures which the engineering team have given me, uh, a 10x performance increase using JSON. So if you're doing all sorts of configuration, particularly if your application is concerned with doing some configuration. Maybe you're uh, you're like momentarily enabling the camera. I don't know on your device, and you want that to act fairly quickly because that might be part of your your workflow to the end user. Well, hey, we've just improved that workflow by by a factor of ten. That workflow performance. Um, this is like the future state. Uh, I would say where we're we're working entirely within JSON. I, 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 this isn't like an announcement of deprecation. In, in fact, uh, as far as I've been told, we're, we're fully committed to supporting backward compatibility with a, uh, a system where your applications can still define XML. So uh, what we have is an intermediary, an intermediary state, uh, I would say here. So in Android 11, you'll be in an environment where your application is defining, you can choose to define your, your behavior in either XML or JSON. And then there's a, some conversion process that happens in the underlying operating system that converts any XML to JSON. And then the rest just acts the same as it did previously. The, the JSON is processed by MX and then the, the result is returned to you. So in, in this instance, uh, it will still be a lot quicker than the existing XML based processing mechanism, uh, but uh, not quite as quick as when everything uh, is finally in JSON. But yeah, we're still seeing like compare the, it was 1.3 seconds to 0 0.2. So I was that six times faster. You should never try mental arithmetic um, when you're trying to do a presentation, I find. Uh, there are a number of changes which are happening as a result of this move towards JSON. Uh, these are changes which you can take advantage of in your application. We're not forcing you to take uh, advantage of these, but obviously I would recommend that you do so for that performance increase. Uh, stage now, you'll start to notice that the, uh, the the output, the publish screen of stage now will look a bit different. Uh, I apologize for the, the blocky resolution of this, uh, this image, by the way. But uh, yeah, so previously there was only a couple of output uh, barcodes, whereas now we have four. We have the two XML ones and the two stage now, uh, sorry, the two JSON ones. Uh, obviously scan scan the JSON one if you want quick um, a quick um, configuration of, of your device or quicker. Uh, but like I say, more importantly for this audience is probably going to be the changes to EMDK Profile Manager. So if you're in Android Studio, you click on the EMDK, um, what's it called, menu option. And then oh, I think it's like Profile Manager, you click after that. Then, then you click on, well, this will give you this kind of window here. Then you click on create. You can choose a target MX version. And if you choose a target MX version of 11, then you will be presented with this create new profile dialogue. And you can choose whether the profile manager is going to output the profile as a JSON or an XML. Now, um, I, I don't like the screenshot, and this is something which the team have changed, but obviously they're using the word deprecated here. Deprecated comes with a lot of baggage. I don't want you to get worried by looking at that word deprecated. We are having this UI change. So please ignore that. Um, I put a black, I'll put, if I put my pointer here, then um, I'm covering it up. You can't see it anymore, it's gone. Um, yeah, and then that's going to output some JSON when you do like define what the clock profile does, for example. Let me just show you, um, actually no, this is okay. So, just to finish this thought, the clock profile then would output an EMDK assets XML file, but within that 
XML file will be JSON. No, it's an EMDK assets.json file. Sorry, oh, forgive me there. Uh, so the, the assets file has changed. Now, this is the current code which you are using. There's a number of ways which our developers, uh, which our developers use the EMDK profile manager. And I'm going to make the distinction here between the EMDK profile manager and the EMDK uh, because EMDK has a number of APIs, like a lot of people use it for barcode scanning, uh, for example, but here we're just talking about configuring MX using the profile manager. Uh, you can either just pass in a profile name. And what the result of this, this profile wizard will do is to generate that XML or JSON file, like I say, um, but that will have a name here, it's a clock profile in this case. Um, this is actually a, um, a, a bad example for a static profile because you're going to be setting the clock to a specific time. But let's say you're setting the clock to listen to NTP time, for example. There you go, it's a more realistic scenario. Uh, you would do that, the profile name, that's going to be the same regardless of whether you've generated XML or JSON. So here, your code hasn't actually changed. All, all your application has done is like you've, you've regenerated the profile as JSON and you get the, the benefit of that speed improvement without having to modify your code. Um, and then you can, um, you can receive the response back. Previously, it was an XML response if you are processing here, but now you can receive a uh, status JS response. I'll just go through back and forth a little bit. So results get status string, results get status string remains the same, but here the results are coming back as a JSON object in which you can, honestly, it is a lot easier to parse JSON. If, if you have any uh, experience parsing our XML, uh, then you'll it's just easier to parse JSON, isn't it? Um, if this is a, a little bit more realistic, speaking to a number of our developers, most developers will modify the profile on the fly. And to keep using that, ex that example of the clock manager, you might be setting to a particular date and time zone. Maybe you're going to read that from the device's locale, and you're going to set that into um, actually, no, you wouldn't be setting it by the locale, would it? Because then it will be set. But you know, you want to set the, the, the time somehow. Um, you would do that by modifying the data, which is going to be passed into the uh, EMDK process profile method. And uh, that's done in this final um, attribute here modify data, modify data here. It's just some XML that you're defining as a string object. Um, probably unsurprising. When you move towards JavaScript, you will be defining that object as a JSON object. So actually a JSON object in code, not a string representation of, of the JSON object. But uh, we, we will have examples of these. I'll just go back and forward a few times to show what the difference is. So obviously a lot easier to create a JSON object than to, to specify the string of, of XML and escape the quotes and all sorts of other uh, considerations that you have to do. The API remains the same, process profile here, though you're passing in a config string, a JSON object, rather than you know, the, the string representation of an XML object. I, I will stress again, if you pass in XML, it's not a problem. It's going to be converted by the underlying Android system. So I'm not saying you need to rewrite your applications for Android 11. I'm just making you aware that there is this new feature available to improve the processing of your code. Uh, and then in terms of processing responses, which are, is, in my opinion, the probably most useful part of, uh, of this change, is previously you got back a, um, a, a complicated uh, XML object, which you had to parse yourself and pull in an XML parser because Android doesn't come one with uh, by default and all sorts of other complexity. But here you just receive a JSON response back, very easy to parse using the standard JSON libraries. Uh, just to show a real world example of what this might look like. Uh, so here in the XML, I've highlighted in red the kind of interesting bits. Uh, there was a clock characteristic error um, exception, whereas here you can just look at the you know status dot response dot status field. I might be reading that wrong. It's it, obviously I've had to change the indentation for this slide, but you get the idea. It's a lot easier to parse a JSON response than it was to parse an XML response. Um, and our job is to make your developer lives easier. So hopefully this, this is, has done that. Uh, the other change which I want to make you aware of 
And I think I did cover this in my in my previous um, deck on Android 11, but Google have made a change to um, a package visibility, they call it. And you can you can look for Android 11 package visibility. There'll be Stack Overflow posts and all sorts of other stuff about just how Android have, has changed the system fundamentally uh, to restrict which applications your app can, can have knowledge of on the device. Like you can no longer call an API and just find out which other applications are, are installed on the device, your privacy concerns and all of that. Um, but this has had a run-on effect on Zebra features, which are exposed through a service. I want to get the, the terms right as well, um, because we want you to be able to interact with our services. Um, and you can't do that with package visibility unless you put the appropriate thing in your Android manifest. So if you are targeting Android 11, which is API 30, or above, uh, then you just need to be aware that if you're using any of these uh, technologies, so OEM Info, EMDK, Secure Storage Manager, uh, then you need to modify your Android manifest and just add these uh, these pieces of code in, uh, in at the appropriate point in the Android manifest. Uh, there, I have done a couple of examples for OEM Info. Certainly, uh, my samples will work in Android 11. I've worked with the other developer relations guys, and they're updating their 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 samples to work with Android 11 also. So you've got a, a sample there in both Java and Xamarin. I think we we did for for OEM Info. Uh, but just be aware. If you're using the MTK Profile Manager on Android 11, it all comes together, uh, then uh, make sure you update your manifest. Secure Storage Manager, I have not gone into. Uh, I will be going into that more when I talk about scope storage in my scope storage presentation. So please um, come along to that uh, if you want to learn more about scope storage manager, uh, sorry, secure storage manager. The, the other thing to be aware of, I was having a bit of a panic this morning because uh, it wasn't working for me, uh, but just make sure you clean build and then rebuild if you are changing your manifest in terms of scope storage manager there. But yeah, that's the, the, the lines of code that you need to add. So with that, I would like to move on to some of the changes which have been made in Android 12. And obviously these aren't set in stone and what I normally like to do is to talk about how these changes affect Zebra devices, but we we don't know yet. We're still working on that. I'll be honest with you. Um, so this this is a slide which I, I update every year. I've been doing it since um, since I first started doing these talks on Marshmallow. The the aim here is to 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 demonstrate that if you look at the rows, it tends to be the same thing that changes in the OS from version to version, things that you need to be aware of. Um, you need to be aware that there are changes. For example, if your application is running in the background, how your application does background work changes from version of OS to version of OS. So in Android 12, there are additional restrictions. There is a new restrictive bucket, and there are new restrictions on foreground service. And hopefully, we'll, we'll get to those um, in, in, the, in, in a minute. Uh, just bear in mind that all changes are cumulative. So if you are running on or targeting Android 12, for example, and running targeting differs depending on which uh, which restriction we're talking about here, um, you will still be subject to the restrictions introduced in Android 11, 10, Pi, Oreo. You know, it, it, it's cumulative. You, you know what cumulative means. Um, there are always, it feels like, changes to notifications that you need to be aware of uh, in an enterprise environment delivering notifications is uh, timely and important for many use cases. There are always a couple of other changes which affect enterprise, kind of have a, a catch-all bucket here. And in terms of Android enterprise features, uh, if, if you were present on my, my slide where I talked about the uh, EMMs and MDMs, then I mentioned briefly on that, uh, that slide the DPM API, the Device Policy Manager, API. And this is an API which is available to EMMs. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is, although there was like initially some really interesting, I mean, it's all interesting, don't get me wrong, uh, but there was some big changes that happened in terms of Android Enterprise. Recently, it's just been incremental updates to the DPM API, which is only available through your EMM. So I, I can't tell you what new features so okay, let me let me word it slightly differently. Google will make new features available through the DPM API, and then it's up to the EMM to 
surface those to you as uh, an administrator or to have those uh, take effect on your device. So just, just be aware that when you're reading through Google's what's new for enterprise in Android, that it's, it's all very well saying that, but what you really want to know is what's newly introduced in my EMM for Android. I, I can't tell you that because obviously there's, there's many different EMMs that you might be using. So um, with that in mind, and uh, with half an eye on the clock, let me just go through some of the biggest changes that I see uh, coming up in Android 12, which may well affect you as an application developer. Things to be aware of moving forward. I don't have specific advice and recommendations at this stage. I'm just trying to raise awareness. Um, so the first one I wanted to bring up was an enhancement or a change to restrictive app standby bucket. And these application buckets were first introduced in Android Pi. And uh, it, it honestly, I'd kind of forgotten about them because I spoke about them extensively when we had our sort of release, partial release of Android Pi. And, and since then, they didn't give anyone any problems as far as I saw on the developer portal or people came to me with questions. Um, everything just worked. So hopefully this won't be uh, a, an issue for you. Um, again, just because Google's changed the buckets doesn't mean you know, that there's going to be a, a, a change in how you should be behaving. Um, but just be aware that there is a new restricted bucket, which has been added. Um, so buckets, actually, let me just uh, rewind. Uh, buckets are a way for Android to decide on how an application should behave uh, like in the background. Um, how much uh, how much CPU time it gets, how much how how able it is to communicate with the network, how many Firebase cloud messages it will receive. Um, so Android tends to like put an application in the active bucket when you are actively using that application when it's in the foreground, and then if it's in the background, it will be put in the working set, and if it's not used very often, it gets it's uh, it's functionality increasingly degraded over time. So there's a new bucket added, a restricted bucket. And in the restricted bucket, uh, in fact, let me just go to um, let me just go to the, the slide here. So this is copy and pasted from my Android Pi presentation, but I've added this new row here for restricted. So just be aware that if your application ends up being put in the restricted bucket, then um, there's even more restrictions than than rare. Um, you can only run jobs and inexact alarms once per day. There's fewer expedited jobs. Expedited jobs is a a new API, incidentally, uh, and I'll, I'll cover that in a, a pre in a subsequent slide. Uh, five S cloud messages. You can only receive up to five high priority cloud messages a day. The important distinction in high priority cloud messages there is you you can only receive when your device is in doze mode. You can receive FCM high priority messages. And that's why you might want to receive high priority messages because it wakes your app up. And those maybe you don't have to wait 15 minutes or so before you can respond to the remote request from FCM. Um, but I, I've said a lot of worrying things in this slide. Like, like I said, this doesn't really affect many of our developers. Um, they, if you look at how applications are used in enterprise, they don't really end up finding themselves outside of that working set, um, or active or working sets. If you are really concerned about how your application or about which bucket your application is in, there are some workarounds. Um, we do recommend that you work with the restrictions. This is like Google's recommendation. We don't have an API to say, you know, disable frequent bucket or disable the rare bucket. And we don't have that for these existing buckets. So I do not expect we would add something for the new you know, Android 12 bucket. Uh, but what we do have is uh, recommendations to customers. If you are really, really concerned about buckets and how they will affect your application, and you never want your bucket-based restrictions to be in effect, then there is a feature in Android which allows, um, I've not worded that very well. If, okay, if your application is exempt from those mode, it will also be exempt from app standby buckets. So um, there's a number of ways to exempt your application from doze mode, which you can either use uh, the, the, the special access settings, I think it is, on the device. Um, the user can do that. You might be familiar with that from your phone, particularly if you've downloaded some, some, some dodgy apps uh, that are trying to do like power management, consumption, and all sorts of other stuff. But uh, if if you are concerned about this and you want to exempt your application from those made in an enterprise manner, you can do that through uh, stage now or OEM config 
using uh, our MX, using the App Manager, you can exempt a particular application using the package name, or you can disable Doze mode entirely on the device uh, using the Power Manager again through OEM config. Just bear in mind, as Aunt May would say, with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, if you do exempt even just a single application, depending on the application, how the application behaves, you can increase the power consumption on your device. So just, just bear that in mind um, as you are exempting your app. But we try and give you that flexibility. Um, I've kind of dwelled on this, but you know, hopefully this gives you uh, some explanation of this new app standby bucket that's been added. Uh, the, uh, the other Two big changes that I definitely want to cover in this presentation are uh, a foreground service, two, two changes to the, to the foreground service. And these are the uh, notification user experience delay. So I, I, I mean, personally, and I, I managed to get some screenshots of these. Um, every now and then, some of my applications would just pop up and say, hey, I'm doing some work in the background. And so I like WhatsApp would do this occasionally. Uh, my email would do this frequently. And uh, also I've got a um, NHS like COVID tracker on my phone and the COVID tracker would pop up and say, hey, scanning for whatever in, in the background. And honestly, particularly in the, in the case of the COVID app, I was like, oh no, what why is it giving me a notification? And then it would disappear after a few seconds. Or my email, I think, oh, I've got a new email. But no, it wasn't a new email. It was just telling me it was checking for email in the background. Um, and uh, so in order to like, avoid this false positive, as it were, um, particularly in the case of the COVID app, then uh, like the, the new restriction is oh, it's not a new restriction. The new feature, and I really like this actually, is if that, if that um, notification is only going to appear for less than 10 seconds, then it's not actually going to be shown to the user at all. So from Android 12, you should no longer see these, uh, these pop-ups appearing. So just bear that in mind. I'm, I'm not sure uh, like whether this has too much, um, too much, uh, like, what I'm trying to say, for, for enterprise, um, there might not be as much of a use case in these kind of annoying messages, but just bear in mind that if your application uh, it needs your message to be seen immediately. There are some exceptions. So just check the Google documentation for this. Uh, you just make sure that you are on that exception list if you need the notification to be shown to your users immediately. Um, as we go through this deck, at the bottom here, I've tried to clarify whether the change applies to all applications or to just applications which target uh, Android API 31, which is Android 12. Uh, so this, this particular change applies to all apps. But the, the next change applies only to applications targeting Android 12. And this is a bit of a bit of a more, I don't want to say more concerning. Um, you, you need to understand this a little bit better. Uh, if your application is doing long running work in the background. So from Android, well, from, from, from forever almost, um, there's been a desire with Android to restrict what an application can do in the background. And it's, it's been a, an ongoing challenge for some developers who need their application to never go to sleep, to always run in the background. That's why we enable the, the ability to disable those mode uh, on, on our devices. But frequently, applications will choose to display a foreground service if they want to do long running work in the background. So you'll always have a notification from this particular app, if, if you've written it in this way, to say working in the background. Uh, I have, I mean, to, to take a consumer example, uh, I have an application on my phone which uh, displays white noise. I, I use it if I need to like zone out or whatever, and uh, it works in the background. It displays, um, it, it will it will uh, generate noise in the background, but it always has a foreground service notification to tell me what it's doing. And it does that so that Android will never put the application to sleep. It can continue to generate that noise in the, uh, in the background. But in terms of enterprise, maybe you are um, maybe not tracking the user's location, but like Google Maps will have one of these um, Google uh, foreground services to, to to show a uh, to show the map if you're doing navigation or the music player is a very common one to see a foreground service you want to play music in the background and then you'll obviously have controls on there as well um all of that is a very long way of saying that the uh 
using a foreground service to bypass Android restrictions on background work is going to become more difficult because actually launching that foreground service cannot any longer be done from the background. And then Google, uh, in their documentation, go on to say that uh, they encourage you to use the work manager where possible. They've introduced a new expedited jobs feature. The, the work manager is part of Android X. Like It's not like you have to wait for Android 12 to use the work manager. You can, you can download the latest version of work manager, upgrade your Gradle, and uh, use the new expedited jobs feature. Uh, expedited jobs are like there are some restrictions um they're expected to complete in less than three minutes and uh they will and and i it's i normally put it in quotes i've, I've put it in italics here expedited jobs are run immediately provided the system does not have excessive workload so there's there's not actually any any uh metrics or information around what excessive workload might be uh but I, th I think the, the takeaway is Android would do its best to run your job uh, as soon as it can, uh, taking everything else into consideration, power management and it's all sorts of complex heuristics that I'm sure are happening behind the scenes. Um, if the task is not urgent, then I mean you should have done this before Android 12 already, to be honest with you. If, if, you're, if you're running something as a foreground service, then it probably is urgent. But if it's not, then there are existing APIs that you can use in the work manager to set a periodic or a scheduled Scheduled, scheduled job. I always forget which one it is. Uh, most alarms uh, accept schedule exact alarm, and there's additional restrictions on schedule exact alarm. Uh, cannot set foreground service when there are alarm fires. So don't rely on like setting an alarm and then handling that in the background and setting the foreground service. Um, there are some except ex exceptions or exemptions for this. There's a lot more detail in Google's documentation which I encourage you to read. If you are one of these many developers who uses foreground services to bypass these background restrictions. So some of the exemptions are, well, I, I, won't, I won't read them all out here, but um, I, like probably the, the most useful one maybe is if you are happy for this foreground service to happen um, all the time, then you might want to listen to the action boot complete, and then you can still launch your foreground service in, in action boot complete. Uh, the, we've had a number of teams uh, come and do that internally. The, the struggle there though, is the application needs to have been launched at least once in order to action, in order to receive action boot complete. So it does complex, it does make your, your, your provisioning staging, staging and provisioning a little bit more complicated because you, you can't just install the app and then everything will just magically work. The, the foreground service will launch. You need to have like launched the app at least once in order to listen for that action boot complete. Uh, if you are using action boot complete as your workaround, there are other workarounds here. Um, like I said, if you can, then I would recommend going to, uh, to, to Google's expedited jobs. Um, but honestly, this is an area where we are keen to hear your feedback. So if you see these foreground service launch restrictions impacting your development as a, as a Zebra developer, then please do let us know what can we do. Um, certainly if a lot, if, if enough people are asking for it, then we do make changes like we did previously with those mode. But if no one asks for it, then it's difficult for us to, to be proactive and, and be, because you know we don't understand what the real need is. But yeah, please, do let us know. This is going to impact you, um, certainly. Uh, so in the in the remain, or actually, I've gone a little bit a little bit long. I will just cover one more change in Android 12, and then I'll leave the rest to, to future presentations, probably. So the other change is been to the location. Uh, so Android 12 will try and present the user with a with a dialog if the application requests both precise and approximate location. So both fine and coarse, C-O-A-R-S-E location. Uh, Android will take it upon itself to present the user with a dialog to say, oh, actually, I only want to really give the, uh, the application coarse permission. It's what they call approximate permission. I don't know if they're going to localize that image because it's very uh, very American, isn't it, with the, with the interstates there. But uh, uh, yeah, and, and if the if the user only chooses to uh, give 
approximate permission, then the course permission would be granted, but not the fine location permission. And then there's this additional rule that fine, uh, if you want fine, then you should request both course and fine in the same permission request. And things things get really things are getting really complicated with with location permissions because there's this new rule now that if you want fine and if you want fine, you need to request fine and course in the same, but if you want background location, that needs to be requested separately as of Android 10. So yeah, just if you are using location, be aware of all of these changes. Um, most enterprise apps will pre-grant runtime permissions. Uh, the, the act that you saw me show, I had a video of that in my previous EMM presentation, but uh, uh, just, just be aware of this. This is something that uh, it's, it's best practice, essentially, um, particularly if you are like deploying to the Play Store, there's a, a whole Play Store policy around background location. So you want to make sure, uh, and the policy involves you displaying these runtime permissions. You want to be aware, that, uh, aware of what the rules are moving forward to make sure that you comply with them, to make sure your application doesn't, uh, doesn't become uncompliant in the Play Store. For example, it meets user expectations if they're downloading it and the administrator has not pre-granted those runtime permissions. Um, so just be aware of this as another change to locationing. And so with that, uh, I don't want to run on too long. Uh, as the year progresses, we will be releasing a lot more documentation, information on Android 12. We'll be doing more dev talks, I'm sure. And uh, I'll be back speaking externally on, on webinars when we know more about what we're doing in Zebra and Android 12. But any specific questions or concerns about A12, after you read the Google documentation on this, for example, then again, get in touch. We've got the developer portal. We've got uh, Twitter. We've got a Zebra GitHub repository. So just uh, get in touch. And obviously, we, we love to hear your feedback because this is this is the time that we are planning our Android 12 work, and it, it helps to have that feedback so that we can make sure that we ad adhere to, to expectations of our customers. So with that, uh, I will, if there's any overflow of, of questions, then we can take those on the developer portal. But with that, I'll, I'll, I'm going to end the presentation here, and hopefully uh, you're enjoying the rest of the, uh, the DevCon. Thank you.